father of the disclosure movement, Dr. Stephen Greer. I was a witness, as many of you know, in the Disclosure Project in almost exactly on the anniversary today, May 9th, 2001. And so I would not be here if it wasn't for Stephen Greer. Are you there, Steve? I am. Thank you. Welcome to the show. We are so lucky today to get your update on what's going on and what can we do about it from that Disclosure Project and way before since you and I have been working on this for a long time. Um, and I just want to thank you right now for getting me involved in this. But really only did I do this because I heard so many conspiracy theories, myths, legends, disinformation, so much distraction. We've all been discredited for working on this issue if we're truth tellers. And it's leading to destruction, maybe even extinction of our own human species. And you have been, to me, the champion of telling the truth, of not doing it from just side research, quoting other people, but from your own experience in bringing credible people together on this issue. And I just honor you. I know we all do. We've already heard from people from all over the world who are listening to this show live and also archived later. So thank you so much for being with us. And Steve, I'm not even sure where to begin. I know you have so many projects going on. And I think it would help, too, for you to help define some of the terms, that basic terms, because some of the people listening in are new. They're advisors to decision makers in the corporate government military complex, and um, they are international as well. So thank you for coming on. Well, I appreciate it, and I really want to thank you for your, you know, your courage all these years for speaking the truth about these issues. And I, it, I remember when you first came forward, it was, it was a difficult because the, this subject dealing with so-called UFOs, which is a misnomer to begin with, uh, is has been so uh, carefully by the intelligence community uh, ridiculed and put into a compartment of kookiness. And not only that, but they've then put out information that's completely false that discredits the subject. So when serious people try to deal with this issue, uh, they tend to get tainted, and it takes a tremendous amount of, of internal integrity and courage, which you have, to have spoken the truth on this. <clears throat> and I appreciate it very much. Um, first of all, I think we have to deter, you know, define some terms, as you mentioned. Um, it, in my opinion, UFOs don't exist. Uh, now, what I mean by that is that that term was con concocted by the intelligence community after they figured out that they were extraterrestrial vehicles and after they already had uh, studied the energy and propulsion systems, what the top secret document from Canada called the modus operandi of the, of the spacecraft and by 1954 had mastered gravity control. And I want to repeat that. October 1954, gravity control was mastered. And what that means is there's a, a, a huge amount of confusion in the public and even with the political leaders on what's ours, what's extraterrestrial, and who's doing what. And to sort this out has been literally 25 years of, of research uh, and, well, frankly, you know, over, over $10 million of, of my own funding and, and income gone into trying to figure out who is doing what and what the real truth is. And most of the information that is put out to the public on this subject is, is disinformation that's been carefully designed, as you rightly pointed out uh, in, in your testimony, that Werner von Braun warned us would be a sort of fear-mongering paradigm about the issue about uh, intelligent life <clears throat> in the universe. And I think that if, if anyone wants to, they can go to our website, uh, SiriusDisclosure.com. It's S-I-R-I-U-S, -I -I like the star system, uh, Disclosure.com. And you will see that we have links to uh, several dozen military and intelligence and corporate witnesses like Carol Rosen. And these are people who have all signed oaths that they would testify under oath with penalty of perjury before Congress uh, if they were not telling the truth. And we, uh, I have personally interviewed now over 700 such people uh, who have given me information. 
but not all of them want to come out publicly. What we need and what we're doing right now uh, is the campaign that ends the secrecy once and for all and exposes the big lie. And the big lie is that there's a threat in outer space that we need to put weapons in space for, and in fact have already done so, and that we need to be afraid of. One of the big problems has been, in my opinion, Carol, is that the, the, the whole UFO subculture has become so whacked out with conspiracy theories and rubbish that the truth has been very hard to get to. Back in 1994, I began to have people who were deep inside the national security state, um, you know, provide information to me who uh, have since some have come forward and some have not, uh, and like yourself, have, have come forward that in fact, for decades, dating really all the way back to the 1950s, they had planned to use this subject, and I'm quoting from a CIA to, uh, document I have here from 1953, for its psychological warfare value. Let me repeat that, for its psychological warfare value. So, and this is an uncontested CIA document that I have. So when I began to do briefings for high-level people like the director of the CIA for, for President Clinton and the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, uh, the three-star general Patrick Hughes, and Admiral Tom Wilson, who was the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and members of the Senate Intelligence Committee, and, and others, what I found is that there were two categories of people in government. One were people who were part of a very deep project, which we call an unacknowledged special access project, um, that was illegal, unconstitutional, and had gone completely rogue. And that happened in the 50s on Eisenhower's watch. The other were people of similar rank. It could be the President of the United States. It could be a senior senator on the Intelligence Committee. It could be a three-star general. It could be the director of the CIA. And those people were deliberately being lied to because they were analyzed and found to be not willing to go along with the agenda of the secrecy. And the agenda is to withhold from the public the truth that these uh, visitors are here. And number two, that if they are here, to start putting out false information through the UFO subculture of abductions and mutilations that they are a threat to us, so that they could finally spring something I think is now being fast-tracked, which is why I'm on your show and that is a cosmic false flag operation. Um, and they have also withheld this information because the technologies behind how these uh, objects move would completely give us free energy for the Earth, eliminate all poverty in a generation, clean up the Earth's environment in a very rapid manner, including the ability to reverse all toxic radioactive and chemical waste these technologies we have, and the taxpayers of the United States have spent upwards of $8 trillion that have been confiscated into these unacknowledged special access projects. So a USAP, or Unacknowledged Special Access Project, let me explain how it works, because that's the title of a new movie we're working on, and we need everyone listening to go to SeriousDisclosure.com, and even if you give $1 or $5, the price of a latte and help us do the research and do this expose. We are doing a full-length feature film and also a book at the same time and are planning to do a global concert event. Um, we're looking to have a billion people look at this when we, when we launch it uh, early next year that exposes the truth behind these USAPs, not only what they're hiding but also what they're, they're doing to deceive the public. And, and more importantly, to bring out the technologies that would give us an entirely new civilization on Earth. So the title of the movie is Unacknowledged, and it comes from the first word of what a USAP is, an Unacknowledged Special Access Project. And let me, let me just explain how this works. So this is something that the average person, in fact, many people in government don't even understand it. It works this way, particularly in Congress and in the White House when they first get in. 
I'm sure after some time they realize that they've been had, but initially they don't. And, and actually right now we're reaching out to both presidential campaigns to bring them up to speed on this. But an unacknowledged special access project, as you know, Carol, is one that is not supervised by the legitimate overseers of the democracy uh, or of any government, whether it be in the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, Australia, or for that matter, Russia. These are projects that are deep black, and the men and women I know who have been in these USAPs describe it as follows. The people in that compartmented top secret operation report to only the person in charge of that operation. And even if the general who is the, or the admiral in charge of the Joint Chiefs of Staff or the Secretary of Defense were to ask them about them, they are simply to turn to them and say no such project exists. Now, I have people on my team who have been in these projects. This is not a conspiracy theory. We have upwards of 100 to $200 billion at least every year going into these super secret, unacknowledged special access projects. And the way that they operate is, uh, quite frankly, without any accountability to the people, but also without any accountability to uh, the government oversight capabilities, which means that they are illegal and they are rogue. So between 1993, when I first briefed, uh, R. James Woolsey, the director of the CIA for President Bill Clinton, and 1997, we had concluded <clears throat> that this entity uh, dealing with this, which has been called MAGIC, uh, the Majority Intelligence Committee, um, um, they have been operating since at least the 1950s without the uh, full oversight of the president or the consent of the representatives of the people in the Congress, and that they have then replicated that model throughout other countries. And this illegal cabal is really running the earth into the ground, and you mentioned an extinction-level risk, and I'm going to talk about that during these two hours, not to frighten people, but to make people understand it is time to get off our our hands, stop sitting on our hands. We've got to come together and unite and do something about this. The um, unacknowledged special access projects, or USAPs, uh, the way that, that they have operated and, and the funding mechanisms they have are going to be exposed in this new film. And we are going to <clears throat> not only expose it, uh, but we're going, we're making a call right now and doing the research for people who are whistleblowers. So anyone who has been in any of these projects, who knows how they operate, or who has dealt with the uh, so-called UFO issue, either the ET end of it or the man-made uh, electromagnetogravitic devices, or the deceptive aspects of it, i.e. the... Uh, a stagecraft that goes into hoaxing, abductions, and mutilations, which, by the way, I have interviewed more than a dozen people who have been on hit squads, for lack of a better word, who have abducted humans to make it look like, quote, aliens were doing it. This is not a theory. This is absolutely fact. And yet the public through the media and the UFO subculture really believes there are aliens abducting people, et cetera, and so on. Uh, and that they're mutilating cattle for no good reason. What people have to understand is this is all part of the psychological warfare value of the subject to create the specter of fear so that at some point people would accept the cost and blood and treasure of an interplanetary war. Now, let me explain that again. You know, General Douglas MacArthur in his last address to Congress said, World War III will be interplanetary. These lunatic psychopaths who are in these super secret projects, and make no mistake about it, they are absolute psychopaths. Those folks would love to see us have a situation that they will hoax that would make 9-11 look like a, a picnic day. And the movie Independence Day is just sort of a uh, script 
that's being put out to sort of give people a sense of it. In fact, the new trailer for the new Independence Day actually has a, an Army recruiting uh, part of uh, a logo on it, uh, and it almost looks like a recruiting video for the U.S. Army, and they're using the official seal of the U.S. Army. It's, it's almost unbelievable. You should look at this new trailer if you haven't seen it for this movie, Independence Day. So the script is the narrative that they started creating in the 50s. Now, this is when I was born in 1955, was to create a long-term plan where we go from the Cold War to global terrorism, which you said in your testimony, Carol, if you remember, before 9-11, we did the National Press Club event, which, which had hundreds of millions of people around the world who saw it. Uh, for the Disclosure Project on May 9, 2001, and then on 9, September 11, 2001, we had 9-11. And this has all been manipulated by people who want to keep the fire burning and the funds flowing into these psychopathic, hungry, warmongering uh, sectors that have really gone rogue. And they need to be exposed and stopped before it's too late. Well, I, I'm so grateful because I had tried for years to get the message out that Werner von Braun, who was my mentor, um, vice president of Fairchild Industries when I was a corporate manager, had shared with me when he died in 77 um, that statement that I gave in the Disclosure Project, which people can see with all the testimonies that Stephen put together on DisclosureProject.org. Um, all of those testimonies are there on YouTube as well. I couldn't get it out. There, it was blocked. Um, I was allowed to talk about it, it seems, at different conferences because I had credentials from being a corporate manager of an aerospace company, space and missile defense consultant, and so on, to different organizations, industries, even to the Space Command intelligence community. I've addressed those people and the Senate and House, but mostly about the fact that there is an alternative game plan that we can play, which you also go into. I know we will later. What is it that we can do instead of escalating this war game into space and this mentality? And as Von Braun would say, the technology that you talk about is an extension of the mind. What are our choices? So right. with you putting all of this together, um, this is incredible for to, for people to hear now that None of the ETs are hostile. I know we have gotten ridiculed for saying that. Could you go in a little bit more about that? Well, you know, what I say to people is that this is part of the big lie, is to present that there are, you know, there are good ones and bad ones, and we need to unite around and have this sort of interplanetary war. Ask yourself, who would benefit from this Manichaean world? Mm -hmm. The military-industrial complex. Um, it, you know, the way that demagogues seize power is through fear. Fear is how you control the masses, whether it's through religious demagoguery, political demagoguery, all the different isms out there. It has nothing to do with freedom. It has to do with controlling the masses. So the ultimate way that you would control a planet would be if you, want, if you had these sort of global aspirations for a militaristic planet, which, is, which they do, is to have a threat bigger than a few thousand, you know, terrorists running around in the Middle East. You you need to present a bigger problem, and so that's what they have concocted. Now, if we, I want to talk science for a moment. I mean, I know this is you, you've had a science background, Carol, and I, I don't want to get too arcane here, but let, and and not only just science but logic. Let's say you're an interstellar capable civilization, meaning you have the technology to go from one star, star system to another star system, okay? You're not using, you know, what Elon Musk is doing at SpaceX, these, these primitive rockets that Werner von Braun first started using in World War II in the 1940s. This is really primitive junk. All right, you're dealing with trans-dimensional physics, physics that go beyond the crossing point of the speed of light um, <clears throat> and that allow for objects to move from one dimension through other dimensions from one point in space-time to another point in space-time, let's say of a star system in 
in the Andromeda galaxy that's two and a half million light years from here. Well, at the speed of light, it would take two and a half million years to get here. That's too, you couldn't do it. No one's going to live two and a half million years. So the physics behind this, by the way, are very well understood. We understand them. And have been studied at Lockheed Martin Skunk Works and my uncle's old company, Northrop Grumman, and other places for 70 years. Now, you know, since World War II. Now, if you were to have this type of technological capability, um, the idea that as some, the lunatic fringe in the UFO subculture would present, that you would be there for 290 million years, warring alien races fighting over the planet Earth. Um, something right out of a science fiction book or some religious cult. Frankly, it doesn't pass the laugh test for anyone who has a scintilla of scientific knowledge. How in the world would any kind of conflict go on for more than a fraction of a second if you have technologies that enable you to go beyond the speed of light? beyond the speed of electrons and atoms. We're talking something <clears throat> much more powerful than a hydrogen bomb. Your level of technology, your level of understanding space and time and matter transcends the atomic level and the nuclear level, for goodness sake. So anyone who had a hostile, violent orientation, well, look, about the time we detonated the first atomic bomb at, Bikin at the... Uh, uh, White Sands and the first hydrogen bomb at Bikini Atoll in 1950, uh, early 1950s, it would have all been over. It would have been point, set, match, done. So it, the technologies that an interstellar civilization possesses, uh, if they were put towards violent warfare, would result in the complete elimination of an entire planet instantly. I'm not talking about a city, an entire planet. So the idea that there is some sort of a Star Wars shooting war between planetary systems out there, look, it sells great movies. It sells great science fiction. Uh, it makes for great religious cult uh, sort of belief systems in some cults. It has no basis in science, in fact, and no evidence for it. And yet that's what's being sold to the public. And I think that one of the problems is, is that no one with a scientific background uh, is talking about what I'm, what I'm discussing right now, is what would the weapon systems look like of a, quote, hostile interstellar civilization? Well, my friends, let me tell you, I said this to, to a colonel at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base where the Roswell remains were sent. In fact, he was in that division. And he brought this issue up. I, sir, I said, sir, with all due respect, yeah, Colonel Canola, given the galactically stupid things we have been doing, shooting at these objects, using scalar, Tesla-like, uh, electromagnetic weapons to knock them out of the sky, uh, that's what happened at Roswell, by the way, um, and at other places, <clears throat> if they were hostile, it would have been over, point, set, match, done 50, 60 years ago, 70 years ago. So I, I think that people love to have someone to hate. And so we have to look at what are the roots of this atavistic proclivity, this tendency to go back to this primitive of us versus them that has gotten us to this point, not only with fellow humans, but also now where we're trying to extrapolate that into space with you know, life forms that are, that are concerned about the Earth. I think it has to do with the fact that as primates, we're 98% identical to chimpanzees and uh, gorillas, there is this tendency to be afraid of otherness and then to organize into troops and to engage in warfare, which actually chimps do. So there's this aspect of humanity that has to be transcended through higher spiritual consciousness, in my opinion, and spiritual development and rational thought. So we don't always have the default position, it's different, let's kill it.
it's different, let's hate it. Whether it's gay people, whether it's black people, whether it's women, whether it's this religion or this ism or that ism, the problem with humans is that we have the default position that the otherness is something we need to hate and we need to fight and organize ultimately into organized murder around, which primates do, which is called warfare. Now, we're past the point, I think we're 100 years past the point, where we needed to have large-scale scale war on this planet. It should have, we shouldn't have had World War I and World War II. We certainly don't want World War III, and we certainly don't want an interplanetary conflict. Now, the only way we're going to avert that is a genuine spiritual awakening, but also an expose of the manipulative people who want to put information out there that is false disinformation and that is designed to hit all the hot buttons of fear that result in people hating someone who is other, different than them. And this is something that, you know, as an emergency and trauma doctor, I would see people come in over the most trivial things where the guns and knives would come out. Uh, because of some small conflict. Well, those were tragedies, and I would help save their lives, and many times I did. <clears throat> However, now when we're talking with nuclear weapons, and beyond that, in the classified USAP world, scalar weapons that are longitudinal, scalar weapons that are go at multiples of the speed of light, uh, which you know we can get into if you like, those, those systems were developed by humans way back in the 40s, 30s, 40s, and 50s also and began to be experimented with. Those weapons can't be allowed to go into space uh, any further or be used in open warfare, but they have been used. This is the whole point. There has been years where they've already been used to target these extraterrestrial vehicles. That's how we have managed to down so many of them. And I have worked with many people who have been in these covert programs where they have targeted uh, extraterrestrial vehicles and been able to hit them and bring them down. Now, it doesn't happen every day, but when it does happen, it's a terrible tragedy. And in my briefing to uh, General Patrick Hughes, who is the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, which, by the way, is almost as big as the CIA, it's the in-house uh, military intelligence uh, an and analyst group. Uh, within the Pentagon, the man who is the director of that, he tried to get to the bottom <clears throat> of what was going on with these USAPs, and he was basically brushed off. So I was brought in to provide the briefing with one of my military advisors and uh, someone who had worked with Eisenhower in the White House, who was an elderly uh, lawyer at this time. And at this meeting, what was interesting is that uh, he said, you know, before I got into this command, I couldn't have believed any of this is true. He says, and now that I'm sitting in this chair, I know it's true. That there is a group of people who have this kind of knowledge and technology who are running amok. He says, but I don't have access to them, even though I'm the director of the Defense Intelligence Agency. And the same thing was said to me by the head of the CIA. And the same thing was said to me by the man who is the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, J2, uh, Admiral Tom Wilson. So at a certain point, you begin to realize that this problem has to be corrected by the people. How are we going to fix it? We need to have mass defection from inside these illegal covert programs. Now, I've been consulting with Danny Sheehan, who's a constitutional attorney, and a number of other uh, experts in constitutional law, as well as some military advisors. What I devised in the 1990s was a methodology for doing this. And I want to be very careful because on this show, I'm asking right now for people to defect from the corporate world the intelligence world and the military world and to go on camera with their testimony, documents, and evidence about all of this. And the way that we secured their release from their national security obligation 
is that by the time 1990, late 1997, early 1998 rolled around, uh, we had made the assessment and has had it confirmed from the level of the president on down. Uh, and in fact, I had been green-lighted by the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. My friend and your friend, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, was at that meeting with Admiral Tom Wilson. When Tom Wilson, Admiral Wilson, turned to me personally and said, if you have people who can come forward and expose what is going on with these illegal projects, you have my blessing. Do it. He says, because they won't give me access, and I'm the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the biggest military in the world. And I said, yes, sir, we'll do everything we can. Because I had asked him, would he help us? He says, he says they won't give me access. Carol, I had given him a document that's a National Reconnaissance Office, NRO document, that runs the super secret spy satellites that are in space. And some of them are already weaponized, I hate to tell you, and they're killer satellites. Well, she said, he said to me, look, Carol, the Admiral in his office in the E-ring of the Pentagon said to me, I found one of those compartments that he recognized the name for it on this top secret, on this secret document that I had provided to Obama and to, to him and other people. And he said he got hold of that compartment, this super secret operation, and said, look, I'm Admiral Tom Wilson. I'm J2, head of intelligence, joint staff. And the person on the other end of the phone said, yes, sir, we know who you are. And he says, well, I want to be read into this project, briefed on this project. Military says read into. And they said, sir, we cannot discuss this with you. And he says, why not? They said, you don't have a need to know. And he said, God damn it, I'm the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the United States. How can I not have a need to know? And they said, sir, we will not discuss this with you. And they hung up on him. So by this, and this was before I got to the meeting, because I had sent this briefing dossier prior to Edgar Mitchell and me going to the briefing. So what he said to me is that, he says, they are blocking me from doing anything. And he says, what I have learned is that the best thing I have in my weaponry is a B-2 stealth bomber. And these guys have things that can go to the speed of light and beyond that have already been developed in the Lockheed Martin Skunk Works and that can do circles around my B-2 stealth bomber. That's how he put it to me. And Edgar Mitchell was a witness to this, as were several other people. Edgar now, Mitchell was so inspired by you, by the way, that we connected in 1974, and I'm updating a book that he and I wrote way back then um, that has a lot of this kind of story in it, including honoring you, by the way. And we have documents like this. You have a lot. And I had testified before the Senate with the document that was the strategic moves for how to educate people, how to hoax this whole thing. And yet we still have, Steve, these politicians coming oh, out. Oh, I need to say, you need to send me that document. We'll put I, it in the film. Of course I will, yeah. And um, we, but we, I'm very concerned now about the decision makers, the politicians, the candidates who even if we give them these documents, how do we get them to come around and make the decisions that we want? Thank goodness you're producing. Um, are there? I want you to make sure we get in more hints and we do it in both hours. What to yes, do about well, it? Well, there's so much people can do. I'm trying to give people the background so they understand what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So what we did following this was to do what's called a UNOD letter. Now, everyone listening needs to write this down and tell all their contacts who've ever been in the military or intelligence or corporate world about this. It's called a UNOD letter. It stands for Unless Otherwise Directed. And I did a letter, and this was going to be in the film. It went to the heads of every agency in the United States government that said the following. And, and, and by the way, the way Unless Otherwise Directed letter works in military circles is that if someone writes to their commander or to uh, an agency with an unless otherwise directed letter, it says, unless otherwise directed, this is my assessment, 
this is what I'm going to do unless I am otherwise directed. In other words, there's no overt act that needs to be taken after that. Mm -hmm. But you have to prove they received it. So what we did, we sent it return receipt requested and by couriers that where it was signed. And in this unless otherwise directed letter, we stated the following that we have done briefings for all of these top people in the United States government and similar people in the United Kingdom. These people have been lied to and denied access from the president on down to this type of uh, intelligence and compartmented operation. That is illegal and unconstitutional. Therefore, a priori, all those projects are running illegally and outside the law and cannot use the law, including the National Security Act, to enforce the secrecy of anything they are doing or any personnel, human intelligence, materiel, documents. Those are all fair game for disclosure because the projects themselves are illegal. And unless otherwise directed, we are going to start bringing forward, and this is what we did with the Disclosure Project, top secret documents, top secret testimony, people who were in these unacknowledged special access projects, people who had signed security oaths, and they are exonerated forever from any penalty under law because the the project that is man the people who are managing these secret projects are doing it in a way that is illegal and unconstitutional. You, do you know from late 1997 and early 19, I gave them a 60 day period to respond. From that time until now, no one orally or verbally, verbally or in writing, has gotten back to me and said, you are wrong. No one. And in fact, I've gotten more and more confirmation that we are right. What this means is anyone who's at the Lockheed Martin Skunk Works Cube in the high desert underground in California, anyone at SAIC, anyone at MITRE Corporation, anyone at Booz Allen Hamilton, anyone with Northrop Grumman, Boeing, anybody with the CIA, NSA, Department of Defense, any branch of the military, et cetera, and so on, in this country or in our ally countries that have information, documents, material, physical proof, you can bring it to me and we will disclose it. And you are not going to be subject to any penalties. Now, this takes courage, but that's what people have been doing. You were courageous. Other people have been courageous. We need to have a, this is, when I say that we have launched the campaign that ends the secrecy, we're not doing a campaign to ask the political leaders to do something because they're the emperor that has no clothes. We the people are going to do it because we the people have been asked to do it by the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the United States of America, who was himself blocked from these projects. So this is what people have to understand. They have to listen very carefully with what I'm saying. I'm being very, very precise in what I'm saying. So this unless otherwise directed letter has never been contradicted, ever. And nor can it be. Because if anyone tried to enforce the National Security Act on anyone coming forward with this information, we would take them to court. And even if it was an in-camera proceeding, we'd be able to prove that there were these high-ranking people in both the Congress, the pres the White House, the Pentagon, and CIA that absolutely were denied access and were lied to, actively lied to in real time while they were in office, not as former CIA directors or former members of the Senate or former congressmen, but when they were in those positions of responsibility. <clears throat> and it's not one or two, it's dozens of them that I have met with. Now, there are a lot of posers out there in this disclosure movement who claim they're a lobbyist for the UFOs and this and that. Those are people who've never met with anyone in actual power. We have. Okay, I want to be really clear about that. This is the real deal here. And this is not a fantasy. It's serious stuff. And I say this with absolute authority. 
that these unacknowledged special access projects are criminal enterprises. They are, in fact, uh, Danny Sheehan and I concluded, they're the biggest racketeering influence corrupt organization on earth, RICO. And if we wanted to, we could do a civilian invocation of the RICO laws and go after them. Uh, but it would be a very expensive legal battle. It's better just simply to say, okay, this stuff, boom, all hits the light of day. And so what we're doing with Unacknowledged, both the film and the book, and with the movement that will continue on and on and on into the future, this isn't a one-shot deal, is to have a steady level of defection to people who are patriotic for not only their country but for humanity and bring out the truth about this. So we want people who are whistleblowers, who know about any and all aspects of this, and there is a special contact box at our website, which is SeriousDisclosure.com, S-I-R-I-U-S Disclosure.com. And if you want to see some of our videos, you can go to our YouTube channel, which is YouTube.com slash S, like serious, uh, S Disclosure. So it's YouTube.com S Disclosure. And if you want to contribute to the, the film, the movie, and the movement, uh, it is fundraising.seriousdisclosure.com. So we need help from, from uh, millions of people, really. This is a huge movement that we need to, to launch, uh, that we have launched already, but that we go want to go to the second big exponential burst of disclosure on this, because you know, Carol, we're running out of time. Because, you know, when you came forward in, in, in 2000 and gave that interview and then in 2001 at the National Press Club, 9-11 hadn't even happened yet. It, what you said was so prescient and predictive. Well, and, and of course, part of your testimony was that Werner von Braun talked about the hoaxing of an alien threat in space by these psychopaths, military, industrial, warmongering nut jobs. And frankly, now we're seeing the signs everywhere that this is being fast tracked. Uh, and uh, in the last few months, in the last few weeks, even uh, we have seen indications that they're going to try to fast track this. And the only way to avert it is to expose it in advance. Imagine if someone had exposed what was going to happen on 9/11 before 9/11 happened. You see what I'm saying? That's what we've got to do. It really is. I mean, I don't want to be melodramatic. It is the fate of the world here. Well, um, I'm one of those people out here who I've been written up, introduced as an optimistic, idealistic realist. But I think if people knew how pessimistic and depressed I've been lately, I, I know that this is something people relate to because I'm getting hundreds of letters from people that say things like that. And what I hear from what you're doing is it's not just giving us hope. I don't even want to hear the hope thing anymore. What I want to hear is what you're doing. What are the facts, not the fiction that people present as facts? Right. And what what are, what are the real facts that lead us to a new vision? You know, you know, I've been working on getting a treaty signed with a wonderful group of people, the former Minister of Defense of Canada, whom you know very well, one of our witnesses, the Honorable Paul Hellyer, who's also done this show, as has have Abe Krieger, who was 37 years Boeing executive. He actually put together the U.S.-Soviet part of the International Space Station, worked on the Lunar Orbiter. We have some great people, including, of course, Edgar Mitchell and you and people that have come up with different elements to this treaty. Um, Will Miller, who's one of our advisors, too, also contributed to overseeing, to seeing, making sure that we're grounded, but not in an earthbound way bound, capital B-O-U-N-D way, but with a cosmic higher frequency of consciousness applied to whatever we put out now. And if people want to read that treaty, by the way, it's on peaceinspace.com. And we also, uh, you have books I want to mention that people can get that have a lot of the background, including a lot of the testimonies, Disclosure, your book that is the Disclosure book, Extraterrestrial Contact, the evidence and implications, hidden truth, forbidden knowledge. These are great background books. There's another one by Susan Babcock that covers a lot of this called For the Children. And these are some background pieces. That one has some of my personal story in it too, but leads to where we're going with this, which is 
the truth telling of this issue unlike it has ever been told before right. without all the garbage that's I think is just the myth and legends, the things that people have quoted and pushed through the ufology kind of community or the peace groups too, where they're blaming, right. you know, the Nazis run the space program. Of course, they're all dead, but I mean, it's so much dis disinformation. And well, so I think people also have to understand that there's been a long-term psychological warfare plan that has been worked very carefully by these folks yes. to set up the psychological foundation for people to be afraid of or hate anything from outer space. It's mm -hmm. been done through Hollywood, it's been done through video games, it's been through science fiction, but it's also been done through the UFO subculture, and it's been done by staging events. We know for a fact that a number of things have been staged that have been made to look like they were, quote, alien, that were 100% human. And this is done all the time. And I had a guy who worked for uh, NASA said, oh, yeah, he says, if, if we have a classified object that's a, one of these anti-grabs and something happens, we'll just stage it and make it look like it was an alien thing that happened. And people will believe it because people don't understand what, what the head of the Lockheed Skunk Works, Ben Rich, said, uh, what he meant when he said that we already have the means to take ET home. That, you know, for decades we have had classified technologies that are in these unacknowledged special access projects that enable humans to have extraordinary uh, transportation capabilities. And, and these technologies are real. It's not mythological. And they've been abused because guess what? Nobody is supervising it. Um, the people don't know about it, and the people's representatives, except for a few that are on on the inside, know about it. And the ones who have betrayed the public, who are representatives, they lie to their fellow representatives. For example, uh, there is a, a Senator a John Warner of Virginia who has been on this committee, uh, of this secret committee, who then would turn to his fellow senators and say, oh, pshaw, there's nothing to it. And I know for a fact this happens every day. I go, I go to briefings. I, two and a half years ago, I was at a meeting in the Great Barrier Reef where I was presenting this to 120 world leaders. And there were people there from the oil industry and the military industrial complex who were embedded just to turn, go behind my back to anyone I provided this positive evidence and proof of all this and say, oh, no, this is all not true, and if it were true, I would know about it. And since I'm your buddy in this elite group, you'd believe me, wouldn't you? You see how it works, Carol? It's all affinity politics. So I think people have to understand how this, this secrecy, and we're going to expose in this movie how the secrecy has run and what the agenda is, and then we're going to show what the truth can do. But what, what's the point of exposing all this? Well, if we expose it, maybe we can avert World War III, number one. Isn't that a nice idea? Number two, maybe we can go into space only peacefully and have peaceful relations with these interstellar civilizations, which is the whole purpose of my work, is to create a higher consciousness and a higher understanding of an enlightened civilization. Maybe we can bring these technologies out to benefit the Earth impoverished masses and, and to save Gaia from from environmental destruction so we don't have another Fukushima and we don't have to have endless destruction of our biosphere through fossil fuels and nuclear power because we have something already developed that's better. And that's the other call I'm making. We want people who have operational zero point or over unity technologies if you are ever going to come forward, come forward now. We have the backers to fund it if you need to have funding. It, now, we don't want to hear of a theory. Don't contact me with a theory. I have, I have file drawers full of theories. But if you have an operational system that is closed loop, meaning the output power runs the input power and it runs a net load of some significant wattage power, get hold of me absolutely immediately, and we have top people who will be in touch with you, and we will take care of you. 
and we will get this out and disclosed. And if possible, we'll have it in a stadium with the top uh, artists and celebrities in the world in a celebration early next year, and we will disclose that new free energy technology to at least one billion people. That's what we're planning to do with this campaign. And uh, we know they're out there, but people have to, again, step forward. It's time for people to understand we have a shot at this because here's our choice. The choice is endless war and destruction on Earth, or we start a new civilization with a new consciousness that is based on the universality of our being conscious beings and that we live together in peace and we transcend all these conflicts. And we bring out these long withheld sciences and technologies that would give us the means to live on the earth without it being destroyed environmentally. And that we live with our neighbors in space peacefully and we ban and keep all weapons and all systems out of space uh, and develop a what I called for several years ago a council on interplanetary relations of enlightened people who work on uh, relationships with these interstellar civilizations so that they can only be peaceful. Now, let me talk about that for a minute. That is so important because, you know, I have no doubt there are civilizations out there who, while not overtly hostile, if they were overtly hostile, we would have been done, but who are very unhappy with the stupid things that these covert programs have done on behalf of humanity. Now, we haven't consented but still, it's humans doing it. So we have some relationships to repair. We have to ameliorate uh, as much as we can uh, this sort of damage of 70 years of, of, of this cat and mouse game that's been going on on Earth and in space dealing with the, the ET issue. And I think we need wise people on this, on a council who will do this, Carol. And we need people who are going to understand what the stakes are, who won't give way to just blind hysteria and fear. So that's what I'm, I think we have to, to do all of this in the coming year or so in order to, to ch have a course correction for our civilization. The reason that I'm doing this American Freedom Radio show, Stephen, is to bring you on because this is the update that all of us have been needing and looking for, and we have much more to do. By the way, the next hour, we're also going to cover um, this urgent timing. It is so critical. We're going to talk about some of the things that are going on, like the ballistic missile defense shield that just got activated in Europe. Imagine how we're antagonizing these enemies. Oh, my goodness. And um, we'll talk more about relation solutions. Um, I know people want to hear more about what you mean by a spiritual awakening that has to happen because we have uh, some candidates and politicians, decision makers out there that don't sound too spiritually awake to me. And uh, it's kind of unnerving because these are people that are going to be making some decisions for us or how, in fact, do we get into positions where we do it. And, of course, coming through what you're bringing out, the operational technologies that are, Von Braun would say, was is just an extension of the mind. And, of course, these beings that are coming from other places and other dimensions, other universes, are not coming here with fossil fuels. I mean, for goodness sake. So Right, exactly. I mean, we're, we're t yeah. talking about technologies that are pulling energy from the fabric of space-time and zero-point field or quantum vacuum. These have been developed, and it's so exciting because think of the beautiful world we can have and could have had 100 years ago. And we're going to get into all of this and more, so stay tuned. We're going to take just a few minutes break right now, about four minutes, Stephen. We'll be right back with you. Awesome. Great. All right. Thank you. Stay tuned, everybody. No rules. No rules. No taboo topics. No taboo topics. No fear of doom. No fear of doom. We are. We are. American Freedom Radio. American Freedom Radio. We want the peace on Earth.
Welcome back to the Carol Rosen Show, Part 2, May 13, 2016, with the father of disclosure. Are we ever lucky? We're hearing the greatest update. I hope you heard Part 1. If not, go back to it. Thanks for coming back, because in this last segment here, um, we're going to cover a lot of different issues and topics that people have been asking uh, Dr. Greer about, and it's all related to the timing, the exposure of the real truth, the facts about the peaceful uses of space that we can have, the treaty, the stories, um, but relations with um, earth beings and space beings is such an interesting topic because we're not getting along too well on earth, Stephen. How in the world are we going to get our consciousness raised to be able to get along in space with the cosmic beings? What do we do? Well, I think this is this is the central issue is that we have a 100 years where we have been deliberately miseducated on mm. so many issues. And and demagogues always find a way to divide people into camps of uh, warring camps. And so we, we first have to realize what is the foundation of uh, interplanetary relations, but of human relations, now that we're a global civilization. Well, it, it isn't the color of your skin. It isn't even your level of wealth. It isn't the culture you're from. It's, it's this very elemental aspect of, of, I call it the deep spirituality without all the religious trappings, and that is the aspect of consciousness and the science of consciousness. And that the mind itself, the cosmic mind, which has now been proven through scientific studies at, at Princeton with, with Dr. John, who I've spoken with. I'm working with Adam Curry, who is his protege, Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> the conscious mind is actually an omnipresent field that is connects all of us, and this is where you know you in the meditative state when you go into deep and silent meditation, and you end up experiencing this non-local mind, the, the aspect of the mind that's everywhere. That is a real experience that humans have had before, since the dawn of of humanity, and. That, if we begin to look at it, is the foundation for us understanding when you look into the eyes of another human, the light of awareness is there. And that awareness within that person and yourself is a singularity. As as, as, Irwin, as uh, 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 Schrodinger said, he said in 1908, and this is the father of modern uh, particle wave theory and quantum mechanics, he said, uh, Erwin Schrodinger said, the total number of minds in the universe is one. That is, it's a singularity. Well, now it's been proven through different scientific, uh, very well-controlled tests that that is actually the case. So an extraterrestrial person, let's call it a person, um, is conscious also. So the foundation for our relationship with that ET would be the same as it would be with someone from the Congo who may live in it, be living in a mud hut. They are conscious, sentient beings. And when I first started off on this journey, I started this for, as the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence and started the CE5 initiative, which is when humans willingly make open contact with these civilizations. And we have done this thousands of times. I just returned from Arizona in the wilderness where we had amazing contact experiences with these civilizations. I was training about 25 people. And what I tell people is that the foundation for that ability is already within every single human being. So this is the spiritual way here. People understand the, the singularity of the light of consciousness. And so you can look at an infinite amount of diversity, which is beautiful. But instead of fighting over the diversity, find this point of commonality. What is the common link? And the common link is that we're all conscious and sentient. And when you begin to think about that, but also have meditative experiences in it, this is the heart of compassion the Buddha talked about, where we are all one. We are the, we are each other. We are all one being. And, the, and that is the dawning of compassion. So this sort of spiritual awareness is going to have to be the foundation. It can't just be an intellectualization and political effort. So we're going to have to have our... Uh, intellectual and political efforts guided by a higher spiritual awareness that has also now been scientifically verified. Uh, and that is that the conscious mind 
is this infinite field, and it actually is a single field of consciousness shining and refracting within every individual person. And so when you begin to think about that, oh, well, you know, not your individuality isn't the same as someone else's, but the light of consciousness whereby you are awake, that awakeness, that essence of awareness, that is one. And so understanding that is a beautiful thing. And that's what we have to also bring. So imagine this what we're wanting to do. Now, this we've engaged one of the largest producers in the world of mat, big outdoor um, uh, concerts and festivals. Imagine early next year having, if we can find one, a free energy device on the stage. And then we have this random number generator system hooked to lights and consciousness on the stage stage that proved non-local mind and an expose of all these secrets and it's with the biggest uh, pop stars and rock stars and celebrities in the world in a global celebration with a billion people watching that's what we're planning to do carol so oh, i'm now stage with all the stars and with all the people coming forward now that have worked so hard that are listening to the show on this issue yes. and throw a point on the stage creating that whole reality. To me, that might be the only thing that also can flip, educate, give the experience to the presidents and decision makers of the world. Yes, of course. I mean, look, the leaders of the world, I've always said, I've said for 25 years, if the people will lead and the mass consciousness change, the leaders will have to follow. This top, this top down business is a joke. Mm -hmm. um, and I have dealt with so many enormously powerful people, ostensibly powerful, who really don't have the power people think they do. And that includes the level of the president and these very high ranking. The real power is with us. And so if we do the disclosure, if we bring out the truth, if we bring out the new paradigm, if we bring out the technology, then they'll go, oh, this is great. And then they'll provide, quote, leadership from behind. In other words, uh, as someone said to me, on the really big changes in society, people who are in power always come in secondarily. It has to be the people who bring it in first. It's a joke to think that these leaders are going to come together and say, oh, we're going to do this. Um, that isn't how change has ever happened, ever. Um, and I, I, what I, and, and if you study history, all you have to do is study the history of how big change. I mean, the, the civil rights movement didn't come from the presidency and Congress on down. It came from a bunch of, of ragtag people who were marching together in Selma, who had no, barely any funding that grew into millions of people. And then the I am a dream speech and Baird Rustin, who was this closeted gay black man who was the brains behind it, helping Martin Luther King put together that movement from a little church uh, in, in Atlanta or in Alabama. So what people have to understand is that that's, we now have to do that on a cosmic level. And, and that the idea that somehow it's going to be some magic thing where disclosure of all this and all this change is going to happen. No. Those people will come along when we, the people, get our act together on this. And I've been saying that for 25 years. The only reason I went to the leaders between 1993 and 2000 before we, you and I and others, did this public disclosure project was to offer them the opportunity to be part of it. And they took a pass. Because why? You know, the, you know why? 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 They didn't have the courage. They mm -hmm. didn't have the courage to see this big of a change happen. I have met with so many people, and the bottom line is not it isn't money. It isn't power. It isn't your position. It's do you have the courage of your convictions? Well, you know, I didn't have the courage until I sat down with you and Emily. Emily really talked me into doing the Disclosure Project because it was my responsibility to do my little part. But I think it was its ego. I mean, there's so much of a massive egomania going on, narcissistic oriented, which, as you know, is one of the most difficult things to deal with, narcissism. 
And so how do we get the courage up in these decision makers? I mean, listen to these candidates. If you say national security, yeah, I'm interested in the disclosure UFO issue because of my concerns about national security. Well, that's the code, of course, to escalate the war game. Or, you know, let's build more wars and not get to know people and what's actually going on and and destroy and rape and kill and put on uniforms and get put down as heroes to do it. It's ego. Right. Well, I, well, it's it's ego, but it's also ignorance. But in dealing with the, the, this yeah. issue, it has a lot to do with courage. It's e- easier not to rock the boat. So mm-hmm. we're talking about a change that, let's face it, in terms of the paradigm, A, we're not alone in the universe. B, we already have the technologies to go beyond the speed of light. C, these free energy technologies would get rid of every oil company, public utility, gas, coal, nuclear power, et cetera, and solar panel and windmill on the planet. Now we're talking hundreds or thousands of trillions of dollars in assets and a revolution macroeconomically like you have never seen. Wow, well, I don't people, cater by background, so I'm hearing your curriculum getting developed. Yes, and so what you have to understand here is that this is about having the courage to see a change happen that should have happened decades ago and has been forestalled with other agendas, the war agendas, control agendas, and ultimately it gets into macroeconomic control. And I talked to the Honorable Paul Hellyer, the Minister of Defense, former Minister of Defense of Canada, who is himself a macroeconomic uh, expert, that this is where the rubber meets the road. You know, it isn't about that there's some big boogeyman threat out there. It's about the fact that if the actual real truth was provided, not the false disclosure that I am afraid is being fast-tracked, Because recently in the New York Times has been covering the Clinton campaign interest in this. The Army Chief of Staff gave a a talk a couple weeks ago about uh, the threats we're facing in the future, including Little Green Men, um, the new rollout of the new Independence Day film with the Army logo and recruiting poster being embedded in the trailer. Um, I see certain things happening where... What I, back in the early, not mid '90s, I wrote a paper when disclosure serves secrecy. Mm-hmm. In other words, we want a disclosure that's truthful and that leads to a peaceful outcome and peaceful interplanetary relations, and the release for peaceful use of these technologies that could save the Earth's environment and eliminate poverty on Earth in a generation. It absolutely is doable, 100% doable. There are other people who want a disclosure that is terrifying, that would be like 9-11, that hoaxes a threat from outer space, and that that in further entrenches the current macroeconomic and military industrial order. So you couldn't ask for a more uh, opposite type of disclosure. I'm concerned about this because they've also found, I don't know, witting or unwitting mouthpieces, even in the pop culture world. You have this, a man that who followed my work and who I spent time educating on this, who is the lead singer for Blink-182, Tom DeLonge, recently on a, on a radio show, saying basically that the aliens have caused all the problems on Earth mm-hmm. and that we need to fight them. And he's getting this information from people inside the Pentagon who are sending him out out as a mouthpiece, providing this absolutely false disinformation to the young people to try to get them afraid of the ETs and to get their support as recruits in this next war. So I think we're going to have to be very frank. I mean, and and it it was horrifying for me to see uh, Tom DeLong go off in, in that direction. But the point I'm making is we're, we need to have wiser and calmer heads begin to prevail. We need to have a disclosure that is about the truth and not about things that just add kerosene to the fire. And this is going to not be done by the entrenched interest in Washington or Moscow or anywhere else. 
um, I'm skeptical in the extreme that this is going to happen except through a mass movement of the people. And by doing what we're doing with this campaign, a full-length, and by the way, we've, are, we've, we've come to an agreement with a major uh, distributor for the film, so it'll be digitally uh, pushed out in, in a way that's, you know, serious, which went to number one on Netflix, the first uh, film we did a couple years ago. This is going to be a thousand times bigger. And this is going to have all this information in it. And then we're, going, we're planning to have a book that will be a New York Times bestseller book, we hope, that will be along with the book, the, the film. And that will then also be kicked off, both those, with this global celebration and concert event. Uh, and I'm hoping at that event we can actually feature an operational either LENR or zero-point energy device, low-energy nuclear reaction, the, the cold fusion, or a free energy device. We're in search of one. Again, if anyone knows of someone who has one <clears throat> that is operational and not theoretical. And that's in this country or any country, by the way. Any country in the world. We have a team now that's been uh, stood up in the last two or three months that can fund, acquire, and open source. What we're planning to do is get the technology, acquire it, and provide it for free. There will be no patents and no intellectual property holdbacks, and it will be massively released to the public. These so are that, concrete yeah. proposals and policies that if any of you are writing up policies or advising decision makers or candidates, please include them because these are positions that are not being taken yet um, that really what Stephen's describing are the opposite of the emerging threats that we're hearing about. I mean, you may have heard just even today, it was in the paper, uh, ballistic missile defense shield that the U.S. has now activated in Europe. And uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin, who reintroduced the treaty that calls for the peaceful uses of space. Again, you can read that on peaceinspace.com. This President Russia of Russia has now changed the position because they have to retaliate. This is just part of that old game plan. And what Stephen's talking about is a whole new paradigm that includes the free energy, the most advanced space age technologies, and the courageously spoken concept that we are not alone. And this is how we're going to heal ourselves and our environment from the toxins, pollutants, methane, and radiation, all of that. This is uh, this talk that you're giving right now should really go viral. I hope people will hear it because there is no threat out there. This is all manufactured. And those of us who are trying to tell this truth are being discredited and we need help. So please contact Stephen and make sure that we all participate in this and put our input and ideas into it. Well, yes. You know, I think that the thing is, is that the people who are the demagogues who are in the intelligence community, they know how easy it is to manipulate people towards hate rather mm -hmm. than love or towards fear rather than open conscious acceptance. And it, it's, it's manipulative. And, I mean, look, you know, we had 9-11 happen. What do we do? We go invade Iraq that had nothing to do with it and spend $2 trillion, create com ter tremendous instability in that part of the world, and now there's ISIS. So this is – but that's done deliberately. In other words – these sorts of things are done deliberately with very well thought through advanced planning by these monstrous interests that have at their core a, a, a need to grow militarism and war because it is one of the biggest industries on the planet. If you take oil and war making, those are the two biggest industries on the planet. So these are all need to go the way of the dinosaur. but. In order for those sort of enormously powerful interests to be transformed, it isn't going to be, I seriously doubt, it's going to be done by some sort of high-level meeting with world leaders. It's going to be happen. That will happen when the people get on board a disclosure process that is a, the campaign that ends it when the people who are inside these projects defect and begin to defect en masse. And which now we have proven legally they can do so with, with impunity, without any risk legally to them. And there's no risk to them personally if they do it correctly 
altogether, which is why they need to contact me personally as soon as possible if they are a legitimate first-hand witness to these operations programs, uh, what have you. <clears throat> and we also need people who are going to defect from the counterintelligence and uh, psychological warfare programs. I have interviewed personally a number of people who have been on abduction and mutilation squads posing as aliens, this is true, sounds science fiction, because of its ability to, to, to succeed panic and fear in the public about ETs. Now, it, you know, when I first heard of this, I thought this has got to be a science fiction story. And then I met one person and another person and another person. The problem is I've had a hard time getting them to come out publicly because this is the heart of the secrecy. If they can put out enough disinformation and stage enough events, and they, people say, when did the false flag event start? Well, when will it start? I said, it started in the 50s and 60s. And they said, what do you mean? I said, the mass amount of information that's out there on the UFO and ET issue have been people reporting events that have been designed, and they were designed in the 50s, to use man-made craft that look like UFO, creatures that look like aliens that are stagecraft and man-made, and to engage in these criminal attacks on people. And people say, oh, you don't think abductions have happened? I say, oh, I know they have, but it's, they're not being done by who you think they are. And people are stunned when they hear this. I said, look, before I ever got on the scene in the 1980s, uh, Martin Cannon wrote a, a whole thing called the controllers talking about the military involvement with abduction. And Dr. John Altshuler, a fellow medical doctor in Denver, was the supreme, I mean, he was by far the best researcher on all the animal mutilations. And he told me, he says, we concluded that using high-tech classified systems, it was humans doing these mutilations, making it look like aliens, so that people like Linda Moot Howard write books like The Alien Harvest to scare the hell out of people that now the aliens are coming to carve you up into pieces of meat. It's all a hoax. Hoax, hoax, hoax. And, and what you have to realize is that the technologies to hoax it were developed by the 50s. By 1954, all of those technologies had been developed to stagecraft this. Now, I'll tell you something scarier. And you don't know this was before you got involved, Carol, but I mean, everyone needs to listen very carefully to this. In 1997, I had a gathering in Washington, and it was a, wasn't open to the public. This is when we were still trying to get the leaders that you keep talking about to do something about this. And we had a meeting with, for members of Congress and senior White House staff uh, at the Westin in Georgetown. And I had my initial, uh, Edgar Mitchell was there. We had our initial uh, group of witnesses who were whistleblowers. One of the men who was there was a man who had been on an interagency committee that back in the 70s and 74, where he told me that they already had all the plans using man-made looking UFOs and other, quote, stagecraft. And he says we could hit a button and launch something that would look like Independence Day. He says everyone would think it was alien, and it's 100% this covert group staging it. And that's what he was going to testify to in front of members of Congress who were there. I mean, Congressman Dan Burton, the man who was head of the Government Reform and Oversight Committee, was there who issued a 1,000 subpoenas on blue dress and the I call it the blue job heard around the world is silliness during the Clinton impeachment period. But he was there, all kinds of people from the House, the Senate, everything. The night before, so we had a meeting the day before so everyone could get to know each other and bond as a team coming forward and have the courage to do it. That night, one of his handlers from way back in the 70s and 80s surfaced, came to his hotel room took him out to a secure facility out in Virginia and basically forbade him and begged him not to give that testimony. So we don't have that testimony, but he told us before he was abducted and taken out of the hotel 
that this is what and, and he says he says my understanding is that that capability was fully operational not only in 1974 when, when I was on the interagency committee but well before then so we're sitting ducks here at any time they can hit a button launch a bunch of things that would look quote alien and they were 100 percent staged by humans making it look like a threat from outer space that capability exists it's got to be exposed people who are on the inside who know of those capabilities need to come forward and speak the truth because otherwise we're talking like the gulf of tonkin in the Vietnam War, where we exaggerated and staged the attack on our warships so that President Johnson and the Congress would greatly expand the Vietnam War into that disaster, or a, a, a situation like 9-11, but something much worse. So I'm putting out a call, is as urgent, that people who know of this, even historically have been involved back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, whenever, come forward, we need you to step forward. It is time to defang the monster because here's what it is. I liken it to the Wizard of Oz phenomenon. You know, if you've ever seen the movie The Wizard of Oz, and there's this old crudmudgeon behind the curtain, and you pull the curtain back, and it's this old crudmudgeon pulling all these levers and scaring the hell out of Dorothy and all the animals. Well, guess what? This is the same thing. You got you got these crudmudgeons back there who are hell bent on maintaining global domination and control, pulling all these levers, scaling, scaring the hell out of the people. But the problem is they really can scare the people and the people's leaders. Remember the nature of these unacknowledged special access projects; they're highly compartmented. Even people at the level of the presidential intelligence don't know all the compartments and what's going on. I have spent 25 years, this is like playing, playing chess in 38 dimensions, trying to get to the bottom of how this has been structured, who knows what, <clears throat> and how it's going to be played out. And this is, the, I'm sharing with you honestly the assessment we've made. Now, now what we need to do is have people who will come forward. I mean, it's been wonderful that these men and women have come forward who have told me these things privately, who are very credible. However, we need people who are going to say it on the record, and they need to say it in this film, on the book, and to the public. Because if you expose this kind of uh, nonsense before it happens, it can't happen. Because it's like the, the who when they said we won't be fooled again. Well, guess what? We have been fooled again and again and again. Well, this one, Carol, you know and I know, from what you were told by Werner von Braun, this is the big one. We can't be fooled by this one. So this is when we've really got to pull out all the stops and and put, move this information out. And when we do, then even the leaders of the world will understand what they're not getting in the presidential daily briefing. If you think the presidential daily briefing has any of this material in it, you're you know you're delusional. They don't have access. The presidential level of briefing doesn't reach to these unacknowledged projects. So that's why we named the, the movie Unacknowledged. <laughs> I mean, people go, where did this name come from? Well, this is where it came from. This is the most important show, personally, I have ever heard. And your message is what's making it so important. The punchline, the, the, the pivotal... Um, piece of this information is that it's a hoax that there is no enemy coming to us from outer space to steal our ovaries and sperms and turn us into gold binding slaves. It's not going to happen. And right? No, it's a total, it's a total nonsensical idea, but right. it plays with the public because let's look at this, Carol. Even today, there are tribal wars going on around the world and in the Middle East or in American cities, where one gang or group after another is raping and killing one other group. And so it's so easy for people to extrapolate the human experience and do an anthropocentric projection onto these extraterrestrial civilizations. And 
the intelligence community knows this. They know this is why this document from 1953, talking about the psychological worth or value of the subject, it is if and it and it was uh, signed by the CIA director at that point. This is why this is so important. Is that and it was referring to the UFO matter and the psychological warfare value it had. I have another document where it's talking about engaging Disney Studios. Uh, this is a, a, not a, a controversial CIA document. This is in a box of a huge box of CIA documents I got after I briefed the CIA director. And this document talks about engaging Disney Studios in the 50s to make movies about aliens that would be along these lines or that were just kooky little green men stuff. And as you know, the OSS that became the CIA used to have Disney do the propaganda films during World War II for the military. So the Hollywood nexus here is very important that people understand. And through this sort of infotainment, entertainment messaging, this has been going on for over 60 years. And this document is going to be in the movie. I have it. Um, I have the document where when Marilyn Monroe was going to blow the whistle on all this, and the, the big mole hunter and leak stopper at the CIA um, didn't want her to go public with what she had heard from Jack Kennedy during their affair about the ETs. And it says in the document, the objects from outer space recovered in New Mexico in the 1940s, I'm quoting. It's signed by James Jesus Angleton III. It's a top secret document. It's 100% authentic. Two days later, Marilyn Monroe is found dead of an apparent drug overdose. Nonsense. Burl Ives, the actor and singer, was on my board. He said, we all know that Marilyn Monroe wasn't killed. But we know she was murdered, but we never knew why. And when I gave Burl Ives that document, he almost fell out of his chair. That's going to be in this movie. You can't believe in the, what the archive is we have. And it's all coming out. It's all going to be in this. Wow. I could tell you, uh, people, that Stephen has been attacked, ridiculed, threatened. I have two terrible things have happened we don't even need to go into now to us. Um, but I, I think in my memoirs, I want to name names because it's so horrible. But what you're presenting here is that warning and also a call to, I think, the people listening to this to, again, get this message out there. Imagine if a million or two people wrote to the two presidents of countries that actually initiated the call to preserve the peace and space, to prevent the permanent basing of incredible, yet to be imagined by most, weapons that they're planning on putting up there. And it's imminent. It is imminent. Right. And we well, all and, and not only that, but there's these unacknowledged projects that are running amok yes. that are already doing this stuff. Mm -hmm. So you have, the, you, have, you have two tracks here. You have the track that's the conventional government game and, and geopolitical competition. And then you have the unacknowledged track that actually is transnational that has been going on for 50, 60 years that's already doing this stuff and which is completely out of control. This is the whole point. These unacknowledged special access projects are so out of control, they have become an existential threat to, the, to, to Earth. And it's not the ETs that are a threat, it's this unacknowledged special access project uh, nexus of programs. And they're a threat in two ways. First, by trying to provoke ETs into a response, by targeting and shooting down their spacecraft, which has happened dozens of times, by number two, hoaxing a threat when there is none, and then stampeding the world into sort of a panic like 9-11, and then number three, by withholding the free energy technologies and suppressing them, up to and including, you know, all kinds of intimidation, um, which is causing us to live in an 1800s paradigm with coal and uh, oil, which should have been retired 70 years ago. And even nuclear power, which is a disaster, if you doubt it, go visit Fukushima or Chernobyl. Uh, we don't need these toxic, life-destroying energy forms. We have these other ones, but guess what? That would decentralize the macroeconomic power. 
And now this gets to the crux of it. Because if we had a peaceful world where people weren't united around a common enemy, <laughs> every village and home and uh, whatever would be self-sufficient when you had free energy so that you could have heating, air conditioning, power, agriculture, whatever, provided by zero cost, zero point energy or LENR systems. So when you have that kind of world, you don't have this big centralized system of, of gang bangsters and what I call the financial military industrial complex that are sitting atop the power structure. The power literally and physically, literally in terms of energy power and uh, metaphorically in terms of political power then goes to the local level globally. So on the one hand, we'll be very interconnected as we are now communication-wise, but we will begin to be transportation and have free energy and very self-sufficient. So every home, village, what have you, would be self-sufficient. You wouldn't be tied into super tankers coming out of the Middle East or transmission lines coming out of Con Ed or, or, uh, or whatever your utility company is. So, and, of course, we're leading to that. Now, what do you say to the people – sorry to interrupt you, but I know I want to get this in. What do you say to the people who say, well, gee, my job is in coal, my job is in electricity, my job is in this? How, how do we address this job-critical situation of how people are going to be living in the new vision? Well, it's a very important thing. First of all, there has got to be a plan. First, you're going to have a 15-year transition. It's not like you disclose this information and every car and home in America suddenly has this. And this is the problem. We're running out of time to do it, Carol. I've been involved with 25 years of this now. Mm-hmm. And if it, you, you look at the turnover for heavy industries, what I mean by turbines, jet engines, um, cars, uh, refrigerators, those are on a 15-year cycle, and some are longer, the big industrial 20, 30, 40-year cycle. So this is such a big – this is like the Marshall Plan that rebuilt Europe, but a thousand times bigger because we're talking about retooling the entire planet with these kinds of technologies. So first of all, it isn't going to happen instantly. Secondly, we barely have enough time to do it if we went full bore and and all this came out in the next year. Thirdly, where there is economic displacement, and there will be, there'll be, you know, there's going to have to be a compassionate social support system put in place so that those people have transition income that support them at the level where they can live in a dignified way while they're being retrained into these new high-tech energy sector technology, which we have done a very poor job of doing. You know, look, I mean, it's sort of like saying we can't have the automobile because the people who made horses and buggies are out of business, or we can't have the have computers because Royal Typewriter went out of business. Well, Royal Typewriter did go out of business. but This is so large that we're going to have to set up a mechanism, and there's plenty – look, when you talk about this kind of economic development, hundreds, thousands of trillions of dollars of economic wealth will be created when you have free energy and you have the 50% of the world's population that doesn't even have indoor plumbing suddenly has this level of prosperity. The amount of wealth that can be created in the world is mind-boggling. We can have a 1,000 corporations as big as, as Apple. Um, just to get this job done and get the transition done. So there will be enough wealth that will be developed from this in terms of economic growth because right now we're way underdeveloped. You know, we, we have a, we're living almost like in a, in, in a, a, a Dixonian world of, of, of soot and uh, filth and, and 19, 1880s coal-fired power plants and gas power plants and transmission lines, when we, when we transition to this new, new system, the amount of wealth and uh, prosperity will be such that I, I predict the average work week will go to between 10 and 20 hours a week. Uh, full employment will be working 10 or 20 hours a week. There will be time for creative pursuits, the pursuit of higher states of consciousness, um, and also the ability to put a 
a, a, a social safety net so that no one is living in the kind of poverty we see in Appalachia or in the in the developing uh, the so-called third world. But that has to be done as a matter of policy. And I think that you know to say that we can't get to we can't let this technology out because of the displacement in the relatively small percentage of people who work in the energy sector, it would be like saying you can't have the internet and computers because the people who made royal typewriters would be out of business. It, it just isn't the way you develop a civilization. And besides the point, if we stay on the path we're on, we're melting both polar ice caps, the oceans are dying, we have global climate change, and on top of it, we have resource depletion. We have to do this. So it isn't a matter of, of if we do this, it's when. And the when should have been in the 1950s or before, but I wasn't around to do this. Uh, and neither were you. We're, 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 we have the situation we've been handed. So we have to be realistic and say, okay, now we're in a genuine global emergency. And all of these things are coming together, the interplanetary a peace issue, the free energy issue, having peaceful contact, and this whole macroeconomic order that has grown up around a centralized energy and financial system that is inherently corrupt. And I think that this all has to get transformed, uh, and we need a lot of wise people who, who will be working on this. But the first step in it is to ex ex do this expose get the truth out, get it disclosed, get the technologies disclosed, open source it. Our policy is if someone wants to be, if they have it patented and they have one of these devices, we have people on our team now that can make the arrangement to buy them out. I couldn't have said that three months ago, Carol. I can say it now. So that is what's exciting. There has been a huge sea change in what we're, we're doing because of the people who have stepped into this network of, of because there are people all over the world in the last year that I've been meeting with who realize how much trouble we're in. And so the good news is that we have the ability to do that now. We have um, people out here listening then to are getting very inspired. I'm getting notes saying we should be publishing everybody listening because not everybody in the world can hear this. And right. not everybody has the capability. I mean, someone from Romania just wrote to me and said, our little village is getting ready for the U.S. defense shield. The military people are moving in. I mean, this is what's kind of still going on. It's the old earthbound game. And sure. you're, you're talking about a whole new cosmic reality and policy. It's a higher level of consciousness that's based on the real truth and facts, not just disregard my advice of all of the conspiracy stuff. It makes me feel physically ill sometimes to hear it. <laughs> I know. I know. And yeah. look at the new technologies. Go to the websites where you see innovations and start talking about them so we can present a new vision. And I think that's what you're presenting, Steve, that's just so brilliant. People can be self-sufficient. They can learn how to farm. It's a whole new way of life. Well, with these sort of technologies, you could have in the Arctic um, an agricultural dome because the energy would be free, where you could have tropical fruit, fruits organically being grown in very cold climates in the winter uh, with no pollution. So these, see, it's a total different world once you make this basic change, but that's why it's been kept secret. You know, when I was at Lawrence Rockefeller's ranch uh, where he hosted the Clintons in the 90s, and you know, he looked at, he took me out one night onto, onto his deck where he had the original Remington uh, statue of the Native American on horseback, and, and, he, and we were out there under the stars, and it was so beautiful. And he turned to me and he said, he said, Dr. Greer, you know, the disclosure of all this, it, it, he says, it's so, the, the implications are so vast and so profound that no aspect of life on earth will be unchanged. And I said, yes, Lawrence, that's why it's secret. <laughs> it's because it is so. So, you know, this is it, it's axiomatic. The bigger the impact would be, the more the extreme secrecy to the point of there being unacknowledged special access project operations um, are, are, are stood up around the, the subject. So the ET subject, the UFO subject, the free energy, innovative technology subject, the zero point, the LENR, 
those all have the same policies that are being run by these controllers. And that's what people have to understand. And the only way around it, I assure you, there is no president of this country or any other that's going to wave a magic wand and bring this stuff out. But the masses can. The people can. The people who have stumbled across this same science and technology who have it sitting in their garage or lab, they can get it to us. We will support them, and we will bring it out, and we'll have every A-list celebrity in Hollywood at this event and the whole world watching. You want to refrain from the 60s, the whole world watching. Then it's over. It's a game changer because we expose the false flag nonsense. We expose we reveal and bring out these technologies, and we say, okay, all these games and nonsense, let those be of the past. Let's start a new civilization with a new consciousness beginning today. And it has to be a global movement. So these are points that when you're putting together your new interviews, your curriculum, your publications, when you're making contact with whomever you want to that you may be able to influence who's making a decision in your local community, in this country, around the world, these are points that Stephen's bringing out that I'm hoping everybody will share as widely as you possibly can because right. these shields that are going up, the disinformation, the discrediting is what's prevailing right now. And this is the breakthrough time. We are not going to get another chance in history. I agree. Uh, it, 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 uh, it's sort of do or die and all the writings on the wall. When you have periodicals like the, the New York Times uh, that have had a, a, an official policy of never covering this subject, covering this subject and about Hillary and John Podesta, her campaign chairman, uh, dealing and talking about UFOs, when you have the Army Chief of Staff talking about the future battles with little green men, when you have the Army having its promotional stuff cross-promoted on the trailer for Independence Day, when you have you know, a rock star being fed disinformation about how aliens have caused all the problems on Earth and we have to go to some big war with them, that's a militaristic approach to this whole issue of, of space. Um, talking on big radio shows and coming out with information and, and books and movies, you know that someone has pulled the trigger on what Bernard Von Braun Carroll warned you on his deathbed about. That's, what I'm, gonna, yeah. That's what I'm here to tell everyone. Thank That's you. why I'm on your show today. Thank you. And the courage that you have and that we all have to have, and yours is courageous and it's contagious. And that's what I feel when I hear you, too, because, I mean, my my space careers book was just taken by two guys who write about space weapons, by the way. And all of a sudden, it removed the quote by Andropov that said the Russians were wet, ready way back in the days of President Andropov to sign a treaty for peace in space and to not test ASATs unless somebody else tested these anti-satellite weapons. That's all been removed, and now there's a new book that got updated with the title of my book without my permission. I've been erased, erased from Wikipedia. I mean, there are little things that are going to happen to people that do come forward. Yep. But you know yep. what? In a group like what Stephen's putting together, we're together in this, and that gives me and the courage and inspiration to keep going. Right. So thank exactly. You. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what would you tell people as a quick summary for what they can do, where they can get in touch with you? Yes, well, we need everyone's help. I mean, whatever you can do. And, and this is a publicly funded, crowdfunded campaign, and you can go to uh, Sirius Disclosure, that's S-I-R-I-U-S Disclosure.com, and uh, help us even if it's every, every little bit helps. You need to become ambassadors in your community looking for these whistleblowers who are military, intelligence, corporate people who know about this. We need people who are out there who are scouts looking in their own local area for people who are innovators in technology who may have stumbled across and have uh, one of these <laughs> one of these zero point or free energy devices and, and who need help getting it out to the world. We are the launch vehicle for that. We need people to be networking in their communities and bringing those things to us. Um, 
we need people to just spread the word about what the campaign is by putting it on their Facebook page and tweeting it and blogging on it and networking it to people in their community because, you know, it's not like we're doing this with some sort of a billion dollar presidential campaign. We're doing this very grassroots and very organically. Uh, and so we need people to help do that for us and get the word out. Very good. And your website and your email contact information? Yeah, seriousdisclosure.com. And if you go to the website, you'll see um, on the toolbar under contact all the different categories. If you're a military witness, if you're a media person, whatever it is, or just info, and you can contact us through that website. Okay. And mine is, of course, space treaty at gmail.com and peaceandspace.com is the website. We have a chance now, folks, to build a new policy, a whole new curriculum for the world. And what I hear you saying, Stephen, is that we've been pretty earthbound in all the decision making that's been taking place. And we're transitioning into this cosmic reality, the truth that you have championed getting out and that I hope we can reach the decision makers of the world with because they're coming from that same old place as far as I can see. Right. And, and now if we have a chance to build a self-sustainable life based on space age technology and information, um, these are places where all of you can go. But I want to encourage people, too, to do your own publications, do your interviews, use this material, this truth that Stephen puts out so freely and help get the truth out because we have been fooled. There are a lot of people out there saying, how are we supposed to know that they're not peaceful? You know, that kind of thing. It's just that you've been fooled and it's time to wake up. The time right. is urgent. Well, the other thing, you can't prove a negative. But what I tell people is that given what we can prove we have been doing, targeting these ET objects and all the nonsense, the fact that you and I are having this conversation and breathing the free air of Earth is the proof that they're not overtly hostile. Because if they were overtly hostile, it would have been over before I was born. So, I mean, you have to think of what the technology technological capabilities are of an interstellar civilization. And then secondly, even if you believe in the paradigm of, well, most ET civilizations could be good, there may be a few rogue ones, the solution isn't going to be weapons in space and warfare. The solution is going to be the CE5 initiative, this diplomatic initiative I started in 1990 to make peaceful contact, have rapprochement, and develop our commonality and have a peaceful, ongoing relationship. Either, either way, even if you're addicted to the, to the paradigm of conflict, the solution is still the same. It's the same thing. And, and that's what people have to also understand. There is no solution to this through uh, massive weaponization of space or warfare or conflict because you're talking about technologies that are just uh, extinction, extinction level uh, technologies. And so we have to have bring a whole new consciousness to this. And as Einstein said, <laughs> no, no solution, no problem has been solved by, by the level of consciousness that created it. So we have to bring this whole new thinking into it. So even if you have that as your belief system, for some reason, the solution that can lead to a survivable outcome and a good future for humanity is, this, is exactly what we're recommending. Stephen, thank you so much for being on American Freedom Radio, which everybody knows is listener-supported network, and we they need the donations to keep upgrading the equipment so that we can stay on the air, so please do help. Go to AmericanFreedomRadio.com because you'll be able to hear this again. It will replay again at 3 p.m. Pacific time. That's 6 p.m. Eastern Time, USA, and it's archived on Freedom AmericanFreedomNetwork.com, the Carol Rosen Show. So please donate at that link and go, go look at the banners. There are other good speakers there, but there's nobody like Dr. Stephen Greer. We are so lucky to have you on the show. Thank you so much for your message you. about peace on Earth and peace in space, which Stephen is leading the way to. Thank you, Dr. Greer. Th thank you. Bye-bye.